Book One, Chapter Seven of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mail de translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christopher Smith. Chapter Seven Literature, Dante, Printing, Reuchlin, His Struggle with the Dominicans thus princes and people the living members of the church and the theologians laboured each in their sphere to prepare the work which the sixteenth century was about to carry into effect but there was another auxiliary which was to lend its aid in the reformation i mean literature the human mind was expanding a circumstance which must of itself had led to its emancipation if a small seed fall close to an old wall, as it grows into a tree, it will push down the wall. The pontiff of Rome had become tutor to the nations, and his superior intelligence had made the task easy to him. He had long kept them in a state of minority, but resistance now broke forth on all sides. This venerable tutelage, which had been primarily established by the principles of eternal life and of civilization which Rome had imparted to barbarous nations, could no longer be exercised without opposition. A formidable adversary had met her in the face and was prepared to control her. The natural tendency of the human mind to expand, to investigate, and acquire knowledge had given birth to this new power man opened his eyes and at every step questioned the proceedings of that long respected guide under whose direction while blindfolded he had moved on without saying a word in regard to the nations of new europe the age of infancy had passed away and that of manhood had begun to the childlike simplicity which believed everything had succeeded a spirit of curiosity an intellect not to be satisfied without sifting everything to the utmost it was asked for what end god had spoken to the world and whether men had a right to station themselves as mediators between god and their brethren there was only one thing which could have saved the church and this was to raise herself still higher above the people to keep on a level with them was not enough but so far from this she was even found to be far beneath them having begun to descend at the same time that they began to rise at the period when mankind began to ascend to the regions of intellect the priesthood was grovelling below among earthly pursuits and worldly interests this phenomenon has repeatedly appeared in history the wings of the eaglet were full-fledged and what hand was high enough to prevent it from taking its flight the human mind made its first start in italy scholasticism and romantic poetry had at no time reigned unopposed italy never entirely lost the remembrance of antiquity and this remembrance having been strongly awakened towards the end of the middle ages soon gave the mind a new impulse even in the fourteenth century dante and petrarch restored the honour of the ancient roman poets at the same time that the former gave the most powerful popes a place in his hell and the latter boldly protested for the primitive constitution of the church at the beginning of the fifteenth century john of ravenna taught latin literature with applause at padua and florence while chrysolorus at florence and pavia interpreted the beautiful writers of greece while in europe light was thus coming forth from the prisons in which it had been confined the east was sending new beams to the west the standard of the osmanlis planted in fourteen fifty three on the walls of constantinople had put the learned to flight they had in consequence transported the literature of greece into italy where the torch of the ancients rekindled minds which had lain smothered for so many ages george of trebisond Argyropolos, Bessarion, Lascaris, Chalcondylas, among many others, inspired the West with their love of Greece and its noblest productions. The patriotic feelings of the Italians were thus stimulated, and a great number of learned men appeared in Italy. Of these, the most illustrious were Gasparino, Aretin, 
Poggio and Valla, who strove to restore the honour of Roman antiquity and place it on a footing with that of Greece. In this way a great flood of light had appeared, and Rome could not but suffer by it. The passion for antiquity, which took possession of the humanists, had a great effect in weakening the attachment to the church in minds of the highest order, for no man can serve two masters. At the same time, the studies in which the learned were engaged put them in possession of a new class of instruments which were unknown to the schoolmen, and by means of which they could test and decide upon the lessons of the church. Finding that beauties which charmed them in classical authors existed in profusion in the Bible, and not in the works of theologians, the humanists were quite prepared to give the Bible precedence before the doctors. By reforming taste, they prepared a reformation in faith. The literati, it is true, loudly protested that their pursuits were not at variance with the belief of the church, but yet they had assailed the schoolmen long before the reformers began to do it, and played off their wit on these barbarians, those Teutons who, living, lived not. Some even proclaimed doctrines of the gospel, and assailed Rome in the objects of her dearest affection. Already Dante, while adhering to many Roman dogmas, had proclaimed the power of faith in terms similar to those which the first reformers employed. It is true faith, he said, that makes us citizens of heaven. Faith, according to the gospel doctrine, is the principle of life. It is the feeble spark which, spreading always wider and wider, at length becomes a living flame and shines within us like a star in heaven. Without faith, no good works, no honesty of life can give us aid. How great soever our sins may be, the arms of divine grace are greater still, and wide enough to embrace whatever turns towards God. The soul is not lost by the anathema of the pontiffs, and eternal love can always reach it, so long as there remains one bloom of hope. From God, from God alone, through faith our justice comes. And speaking of the church, Dante exclaims, O oh my bark, how ill-loaded thou art! O oh Constantine, what mighty evil was engendered, I will not say by thy conversion, but by that offering which the rich father then received from thee. At a later period, Laurentius Valla, applying the study of antiquity to the opinions of the church denies the authenticity of the correspondence between christ and king abgarus rejects the tradition as to the origin of the apostles creed and saps the foundation of the pretended inheritance which the popes held of constantine still however the great light which the study of antiquity threw out in the fifteenth century was fitted only to destroy and not to build up the honour of saving the church could not be given either to Homer or Virgil. The revival of letters, sciences and arts did not found the Reformation. The paganism of the poets, on reappearing in Italy, rather strengthened the paganism of the heart. The scepticism of the school of Aristotle and a contempt of everything not connected with philology took possession of many of the literati and engendered an infidelity which, while it affected submission to the church, in reality attacked the most important truths of religion. Peter Pomponatius, the most famous representative of this impious tendency, taught at Bologna and Padua that the immortality of the soul and providence are only philosophical problems. John Francis Pica, nephew of Pica de la Merondola, tells of a pope who did not believe a god, and of another who, having confessed to one of his friends that he did not believe in the immortality of the soul, appeared one night after his death to the same friend, and said to him, Ah, the eternal fire that consumes me makes me but too sensible of the immortality of that soul, which, according to the view I held, was to die with the body. This reminds us of the celebrated words which Leo X is alleged to have said to his secretary, Bembo. All ages know well enough of what advantage this fable about Christ has been to us and ours. 
frivolous superstitions were attacked but their place was supplied by infidelity with its disdainful sneering laugh to laugh at things however sacred was fashionable and a proof of wit and if any value was set on religion it was merely as a mean of governing the people i have a fear exclaimed erasmus in fifteen sixteen and it is that with the study of ancient literature ancient paganism will reappear it is true that then as after the sarcasms of the age of augustus and as in our own times after those of the last century a new platonic philosophy sprung up and attacked that irrational incredulity seeking like the philosophy of the present day to inspire some respect for christianity and restore the religious sentiment to the heart the medici at florence favoured these efforts of the platonics but no philosophical religion will regenerate the church and the world proud disdaining the preaching of the cross and pretending to see nothing in christian doctrines but figures and symbols which the majority of men cannot comprehend it may bewilder itself in a mystical enthusiasm but will always prove powerless either to reform or to save what then must have happened had not true christianity reappeared in the world and had not faith filled the hearts of men anew with its power and its holiness the reformation saved religion and with it society and therefore if the church of rome had had the glory of god and the good of the people at heart it would have welcomed the reformation with delight but what were such things as these to leo the tenth however a torch could not be lighted in italy without sending its beams beyond the alps the affairs of the church established a constant intercourse between the italian peninsula and the other parts of christendom and the barbarians being thus soon made to feel the superiority and pride of the italians began to blush for the imperfection of their language and their style some young noblemen a dalberg a langen a spiegelberg inflamed with an eager desire of knowledge passed over into italy and on their return to germany brought back learning grammar and the classics now so eagerly sought after and communicated them to their friends shortly after rodolphe agricola a man of distinguished genius appeared and was held in as high veneration for his learning and genius as if he had lived in the age of augustus or pericles the ardour of his mind and the fatigues of the school wore him out in a few years but not till noble disciples had been trained through intimate intercourse with him to carry their master's fire all over germany often when assembled around him they had together deplored the darkness of the church and asked why paul so often repeats that men are justified by faith and not by works around the feet of these new teachers soon gathered rustic youths who lived by arms and studied without books and who divided into sections of priests of bacchus arquebusiers and many more besides moved in disorderly bands from town to town and school to school no matter these strange bands were the commencement of a literary public the masterpieces of antiquity began gradually to issue from the presses of germany supplanting the schoolmen and the art of printing discovered at mayence in 1440 multiplied the energetic voices which remonstrated against the corruption of the church and those voices not less energetic which invited the human mind into new paths the study of ancient literature had in germany very different effects from those which it had in italy and france her study was combined with faith in the new literary culture germany turned her attention to the advantage which religion might derive from it what had produced in some a kind of intellectual refinement of a captious and sterile nature penetrated the whole life of others warmed their hearts and prepared them for a better light the first restorers of letters in france were characterized by levity and often even by immorality of conduct in germany their successors animated by a spirit of gravity zealously devoted themselves to the investigation of truth 
Italy, offering her incense to profane literature and science, saw an infidel opposition arise. Germany, occupied with a profound theology and turning inwardly upon herself, saw the rise of an opposition based on faith. The one sapped the foundations of the church, and the other repaired them. Within the empire was formed a remarkable union of free, learned, and noble-minded men, among whom princes were conspicuous, who endeavoured to render science useful to religion. Some brought to their studies the humble faith of children, while others brought an enlightened and penetrating intellect, disposed perhaps to exceed the bounds of legitimate freedom and criticism. Both, however, contributed to clear the pavement of the temple from the obstructions produced by so many superstitions. The monkish theologians perceived their danger, and began to clamour against the very studies which they had tolerated in Italy and France, because in those countries they had gone hand in hand with levity and dissoluteness. They entered into a conspiracy to oppose the study of language and science, because they had caught a glimpse of faith following in their rear. A monk was putting someone on his guard against the heresies of Erasmus. In what, it was asked, do they consist? He confessed that he had not read the work of which he was speaking, but one thing he knew, that is, that Erasmus had written in too good Latin. The disciples of literature and the scholastic theologians soon came to an open rapture. The latter were in dismay when they saw the movement which was taking place in the domain of intellect, and thought that immobility and darkness were the best safeguards of the church. Their object in contending against the revival of letters was to save Rome, but they helped to ruin it. Here Rome had much at stake. Forgetting herself for an instant under the pontificate of Leo X, she abandoned her old friends, and clasped her young adversaries in her arms. The papacy and letters formed an intimacy which seemed destined to break up the ancient alliance between monasticism and the hierarchy. At the first glance the popes perceived not that what they had taken for a whip was a sword capable of inflicting a mortal wound. In the same way, during the last century, princes were seen receiving at their court political and philosophic systems which, if carried into full effect, would have overturned their thrones. The alliance was not of long duration. Literature advanced without troubling itself about the injury which it might do to the power of its patron. The monks and schoolmen were aware that to abandon the Pope was just to abandon themselves and the Pope, notwithstanding of the passing patronage which he gave to the fine arts, was not the less active when he saw the danger in adopting measures, how much opposed soever they might be to the spirit of the time. The universities defended themselves as best they could against the invasion of new light. Cologne expelled Ragius, Leipzig, Celtes, Rostock, Hermann von den Busch, Still the new doctors, and with them the ancient classics, gradually and often even by the aid of princes, made good their footing in these public schools. Societies of grammarians and poets were soon established in spite of the schoolmen, and everything, even to the name of the literati, behoved to be converted into Latin and Greek. For how could the friends of Sophocles and Virgil have such names as Krakenberger or Schwarzerd? At the same time, a spirit of independence breathed in all the universities. Students were no longer seen in schoolboy fashion, with their books under their arms, walking sagely and demurely, with downcast eye behind their masters. The petulance of a marshal and an ovid had passed into the new disciples of the muses. It was transport to them to hear the sarcasms which fell in torrents on the dialectical theologians, and the heads of the literary movement were sometimes accused of favouring, or even exciting, the disorderly proceedings of the students. Thus a new world, emerging out of antiquity, was formed in the very heart of the world of the Middle Ages. The two parties could not avoid coming to blows, and the struggle was at hand. 
it began with the greatest champion of literature with an old man on the eve of finishing his peaceful career to secure the triumph of truth the first thing necessary was to bring forth the weapons by which she was to conquer from the arsenals where they had lain buried for ages these weapons were the holy scriptures of the old and new testaments it was necessary to revive in christendom a love and study of sacred literature both greek and hebrew john reuchlin was the individual whom divine providence selected for the purpose a very fine boy's voice was remarked in the choir of the church of Pforzheim, and attracted the attention of the margrave of Baden. It was that of John Reuchlin, a young boy of agreeable manners and a lively disposition, son of an honest burgher of the place. The margrave soon took him entirely under his protection, and in 1473 made choice of him to accompany his son Frederick to the University of Paris. The son of the bailiff of Pforzheim arrived with the prince, his heart exuberant with joy at being admitted to this school, the most celebrated of all the West. Here he found the Spartan Hermonymos and John Vesel, surnamed the Light of the World, and had an opportunity of engaging under skilful masters in the study of Greek and Hebrew, which had not then a single professor in Germany and of which he was one day to be the restorer in the country of the reformation the poor young german made copies of the poems of homer and the speeches of isocrates for wealthy students and in this way gained the means of continuing his studies and buying books but what he hears from the mouth of vesel is of a different nature and makes a deep impression on his mind the popes may be mistaken all human satisfactions are blasphemy against christ who has perfectly reconciled and justified the human race to god alone belongs the power of giving full absolution there is no necessity for confessing our sins to a priest there is no purgatory at least if it be not god himself who is a devouring fire and purges away every defilement reuchlin when scarcely twenty teaches philosophy greek and latin at baal and a german a thing then regarded as a wonder is heard speaking greek the partisans of rome begin to feel uneasy on seeing noble spirits at work among these ancient treasures the romans says reuchlin are making mouths and raising an outcry pretending that all these literary labors are hostile to roman piety inasmuch as the greeks are schismatics oh what toils and sufferings must be endured to bring germany back to wisdom and knowledge shortly afterward eberhard of Württemberg invited reuchlin to tubingen that he might be the ornament of this rising university and in fourteen eighty three took him with him into italy at florence his companions and friends were chalcondylas orispa and john pica de la mirandola at rome when eberhard received a solemn audience of the pope surrounded by his cardinals reuchlin delivered an address in such pure and elegant latin that the assembly who expected nothing of the kind from a barbarous german were filled with the greatest astonishment while the pope exclaimed assuredly this man deserves to take his place beside the best orators of france and italy Ten years later, Reuchlin was obliged to take refuge in Heidelberg at the court of the elector Philip to escape the vengeance of Eberhard's successor. Philip, in concert with John of Dalberg, Bishop of Worms, his friend and chancellor, exerted himself to spread the light which was beginning to peep forth from all parts of Germany. Dalberg had founded a library to which all the learned had free access and Reuchlin, in this new sphere, made great efforts to remove the barbarism of his countrymen. Having been sent to Rome by the elector in 1498 on an important mission, he availed himself of all the time and all the money he could spare to make new progress in Hebrew under the learned Israelite Abdias Sforne, and purchased all the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts which he could find, with the view of employing them as so many torches to increase the light which was beginning to dawn in his native country. 
Argyropolis, a distinguished Greek, was at this time in the metropolis, explaining the ancient marvels of the literature of his country to a numerous audience. The learned ambassador repairs with his suite to the hall where the teacher was lecturing, and, after bowing to him, deplores the misery of Greece, expiring under the blows of the Ottomans. The astonished Hellenist asks the German, Who are you? Do you understand Greek? Reuchlin replies, I am a German, and know something of your tongue. At the request of Argyropoulos, he reads and explains a passage of Thucydides, which the professor had at the moment before him. Then Argyropoulos, filled with astonishment and grief, exclaims, Alas, alas, Greece, opposed and obliged to flee, has gone and hid herself beyond the Alps. Thus the sons of rude Germany and those of ancient learned Greece met in the palaces of Rome, and the East and West shook hands in this rendezvous of the world, the one pouring into the lap of the other those intellectual treasures which had with difficulty been saved from the barbarism of the Ottomans. God, when his designs require it, employs some great catastrophe to break down the barrier and instantly bring together those who seemed to be for ever parted. Reuchlin, on his return to Germany, was able to go back to Württemberg, and proceeded, at this time especially, to execute those works which proved so useful to Luther and the Reformation. This individual, who, as Count Palatine, held an eminent station in the empire, and who, as a philosopher, contributed to humble Aristotle and exalt Plato, made a Latin dictionary which supplanted those of the schoolmen, composed a Greek grammar, which greatly facilitated the study of that language, translated and expounded the penitential psalms, corrected the Vulgate, and was the first in Germany, this constitutes his highest merit and glory, who published a Hebrew grammar and dictionary. By this work, Reuchlin opened the long sealed books of the Old Testament, and reared a monument, as he himself expresses it, more durable than brass. It was not merely by his writings, but also by his life, that Reuchlin sought to advance the reign of truth. Tall in stature, of commanding appearance and affable address, he instantly gained the confidence of all with whom he had any intercourse. His thirst for knowledge was equalled only by his zeal in communicating it. He spared neither money nor labour to introduce the editions of the classics into Germany as they issued from the presses of Italy, and in this way the son of a bailiff did more to enlighten his countrymen than rich municipalities or powerful princes. His influence over youth was great, and in this respect who can calculate how much the Reformation owes to him? We will give only one example. His cousin, a young man named Schwarzerd, the son of an artisan, who had acquired celebrity as an armourer, came to lodge with his sister Elizabeth in order to study under his direction. Reuchlin, delighted at the genius and application of his young pupil, adopted him. Advice, presence of books, examples, nothing in short he spared to make his relative useful to the church and to his country. He rejoiced to see his work prospering under his eye, and, thinking the name Schwarzerd too barbarous, translated it into Greek, and named the young student Melanchthon. It was Luther's illustrious friend. But grammatical studies did not satisfy Reuchlin. Like his masters, the Jewish doctors, he began to study the hidden meaning of the word. God, he said, is a spirit. The word is a breath. Man breathes. God is the word. The names which he has given himself are an echo of eternity. Like the Kabbalists, he hoped to pass from symbol to symbol, from form to form, till he arrived at the last and purest of all forms, that which regulates the power of the spirit. While Reuchlin was bewildering himself in these quiet and abstruse researches, the enmity of the schoolmen forced him suddenly, and much against his will, into a fierce war, which was one of the preludes of the Reformation. There was at Cologne a baptized rabbin named Pfefferkorn, who was intimately connected with the inquisitor Hochstraten. 
this man and the dominicans solicited and procured from the emperor maximilian it may have been with good intentions an order in virtue of which the jews were to bring all their hebrew books the bible excepted to the town house of the place where they resided there the books were to be burned the motive alleged was that they were full of blasphemies against jesus christ it must be confessed that they were at least full of absurdities and that the jews themselves would not have lost much by the intended execution the emperor desired reuchlin to give his opinion of the books the learned doctor expressly singled out all the books which were written against christianity leaving them to their destined fate but he tried to save the others the best method of converting the israelites added he would be to establish two hebrew professors in each university who might teach theologians to read the bible in hebrew and thus refute the jewish doctors the jews in consequence of this advice obtained restitution of their books the proselytes and the inquisitors like hungry ravens which see their prey escape sent forth cries of fury picking out different passages from the writings of reuchlin and perverting their meaning they denounced the author as a heretic accused him of a secret inclination to judaism and threatened him with the fetters of the inquisition reuchlin was at first taken by surprise but these men always becoming more and more arrogant and prescribing dishonourable terms he in fifteen thirteen published a defence against his detractors of cologne in which he painted the whole party in vivid colours the dominicans vowed vengeance and hoped by an act of authority to re-establish their tottering power hochstraten at mayence drew up a charge against reuchlin and the learned works of this learned man were condemned to the flames the innovators the masters and disciples of the new school feeling that they were all attacked in the person of reuchlin rose as one man times were changed germany and literature were very different from spain and the inquisition the great literary movement had created a public opinion even the dignified clergy were somewhat influenced by it reuchlin appeals to leo x and that pope who had no great liking for ignorant monks and fanatics remits the whole affair to the bishop of spires who declares reuchlin innocent and condemns the monks in the expenses of process the dominicans those props of the papacy filled with rage recur to the infallible decision of rome and leo not knowing how to act between the two hostile powers issues a mandate superseding the process the union of letters with faith forms one of the characteristic features of the reformation and distinguishes it both from the introduction of christianity and the religious revival of the present day the christians who were contemporary with the apostles had the refinement of their age against them and with some few exceptions it is the same now but the majority of literary men were with the reformers even public opinion was favourable to them the work thereby gained in extent but perhaps it lost in depth luther sensible of all that reuchlin had done wrote to him shortly after his victory over the dominicans the lord has acted through you in order that the light of holy scripture may again begin to shine in this germany where for many ages alas it was not only smothered but almost extinguished end of book one chapter seven book one chapter eight of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigny translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight erasmus his genius his praise of folly his greek testament his influence his failings but a man had now appeared who regarded it as the great business of his life to attack the scholasticism of the universities and convents 
and was the great writer of the opposition at the commencement of the sixteenth century reuchlin was not twelve years old when this first genius of the age was born a man of great vivacity and talent by name gerard a native of gouda in the netherlands loved a physician's daughter named marguerite the principles of christianity did not regulate his life or at least passion silenced them his parents and nine brothers would have constrained him to embrace the monastic state he fled leaving the object of his affection about to become a mother and repaired to rome frail marguerite gave birth to a son gerard heard nothing of it and some time after having received intimation from his parents that the object of his affection was no more he in a paroxysm of grief turned priest and consecrated himself for ever to the service of god on his return to holland she was still alive marguerite would not marry another and gerard remaining faithful to his sacerdotal vows their affection became concentrated on their little son his mother had tended him with the greatest care and his father after his return sent him to school though he was only four years of age he was not thirteen when his teacher synthemius of deventer clasping him rapturously in his arms exclaimed this child will reach the highest pinnacles of science it was erasmus of rotterdam about this time his mother died and his father broken-hearted was not long in following her to the grave young erasmus left alone in the world showed the greatest aversion to becoming a monk a state of life which his guardians were for compelling him to adopt but to which from the circumstances of his birth he may be said to have been always opposed ultimately he was prevailed upon to enter a convent of canons regular but he had no sooner done it than he felt as it were borne down by the weight of his vows recovering a little liberty he is soon seen first at the court of the archbishop of cambray and afterwards at the university of paris where he prosecuted his studies in extreme poverty but with the most indefatigable diligence as soon as he could procure any money he employed the first part of it in the purchase of greek books and the remainder in the purchase of clothes often did the poor dutchman make fruitless application to his guardians and to this probably it was owing that in after life one of his greatest pleasures was to give assistance to poor students engaged without intermission in the pursuit of truth and knowledge he gave a reluctant attendance on scholastic disputes and revolted from the study of theology afraid that he might discover some errors in it and be in consequence denounced as a heretic it was at this time erasmus began to feel his strength by the study of the ancients he acquired a perspicuity and an elegance of style which placed him far above the most distinguished literati of paris his employment as a teacher procured him powerful friends while the works which he published attracted general admiration and applause he well knew how to please the public and shaking off the last remnants of the school and the cloister devoted himself entirely to literature displaying in all his writings those ingenious observations and that correct lively and enlightened spirit which at once amuse and instruct the laborious habits which he acquired at this period he retained through life even in his journeys which were usually made on horseback he was never idle he composed while he was rambling across the fields and on arriving at his inn committed his thoughts to writing it was in this way while travelling from italy to england he composed his praise of folly erasmus early in life acquired a high reputation among the learned but the enraged monks owed him a grudge and vowed vengeance he was much courted by princes and was inexhaustible in finding excuses to evade their invitations liking better to gain his livelihood in correcting books with the printer frobenius than to live surrounded by luxury and honour at the magnificent courts of charles v henry the eighth and francis i 
or to encircle his head with the cardinal's hat which was offered him he taught in oxford from fifteen hundred and nine to fifteen sixteen and then left it for Baal, where he fixed his residence in 1521. What was his influence on the Reformation? It has been overrated by some, and underrated by others. Erasmus never was, and never could have been, a reformer, but he paved the way for others. Not only did he diffuse among his contemporaries a love of science and a spirit of research and examination, which led others much farther than he went himself, but he was also able, through the protection of distinguished prelates and mighty princes, to expose the vices of the church and lash them with the most cutting satire. Erasmus, in fact, attacked monks and abuses in two ways. First, there was his popular attack that little fair-haired man whose peering blue eyes keenly observed whatever came before him and on whose lips a somewhat sarcastic smile was always playing though timid and embarrassed in his step and apparently so feeble that a breath of air might have thrown him down was constantly pouring out elegant and biting sarcasms against the theology and superstition of his age his natural character and the events of his life had made this habitual to him even in writings where nothing of the kind was to have been expected his sarcastic humour is ever breaking out and as with needle points impaling those schoolmen and ignorant monks against whom he had declared war there are many features of resemblance between erasmus and voltaire Previous authors had given a popular turn to that element of folly which mingles with all the thoughts and all the actions of human life. Erasmus took up the idea, and, personifying folly, introduces her under the name of Moria, daughter of Plutus, born in the fortunate islands, nursed on intoxication and impertinence, and swaying the sceptre of a mighty empire giving a description of it she paints in succession all the states of the world which belong to her dwelling especially on church folks who refuse to own her kindness although she loads them with her favours she directs her jibes and jests against the labyrinth of dialectics in which the theologians wander bewildered and the grotesque syllogisms by which they pretend to support the church she also unveils the disorders the ignorance the impurity and absurd conduct of the monks they are all mine says she those people who have no greater delight than to relate miracles or hear monstrous lies and who employ them to dissipate the ennui of others and at the same time to fill their own purses i allude particularly to priests and preachers Near them are those who have adopted the foolish yet pleasing persuasion that if they cast a look at a bit of wood or a picture representing Polyphemus or Christopher, they will at least outlive that day. Alas, what follies, continues Maria, follies at which even I myself can scarcely help blushing. Do we not see each country laying claim to its particular saint? Each misery has its saint and its candle this one relieves you in toothache that one gives assistance at childbirth a third restores your stolen goods a fourth saves you in shipwreck and a fifth keeps watch over your flocks some of these are all powerful in many things at once this is particularly the case with the virgin the mother of god to whom the vulgar attribute almost more than to her son in the midst of all these follies if some odious sage arise and give a counter-note exclaim as in truth he may you will not perish miserably if you live as christians you will redeem your sins if to the money which you give you add hatred of the sins themselves tears vigils prayers fastings and a thorough change in the mode of your life yon saint will befriend you if you imitate his life if some sage i say charitably duns such word into their ears oh of what felicity does he not deprive their souls and into what trouble what despondency does he not plunge them the mind of man is so constituted that imposture has a much stronger hold upon it than truth 
if there is any saint more fabulous than another for instance a st george a st christopher or a st barbara you will see them adored with much greater devotion than st peter st paul or christ himself folly however does not stop here she applies her lash to the bishops themselves who run more after gold than after souls and think they have done enough when they make a theatrical display of themselves as holy fathers to whom adoration is due and when they bless or anathematize the daughter of the fortunate isles has the hardihood even to attack the court of rome and the pope himself who spending his time in diversion leaves peter and paul to perform his duty are there says she more formidable enemies of the church than those impious pontiffs who by their silence allow jesus christ to be destroyed who bind him by their mercenary laws falsify him by their forced interpretations and strangle him by their pestilential life holbein appended to the praise of folly most grotesque engravings among which the pope figures with his triple crown never perhaps was a work so well adapted to the wants of a particular period it is impossible to describe the impression which it produced throughout christendom twenty-seven editions were published in the lifetime of erasmus it was translated into all languages and served more than any other to confirm the age in its anti-sacerdotal tendency but to this attack by popular sarcasm erasmus added the attack of science and erudition the study of greek and latin literature had opened up a new prospect to the modern genius which began to be awakened in europe erasmus entered with all his heart into the idea of the italians that the school of the ancients was that in which the sciences ought to be studied that abandoning the inadequate and absurd books which had hitherto been used it was necessary to go to strabo for geography to hippocrates for medicine to plato for philosophy to ovid for mythology and to pliny for natural history but he took a farther step the step of a giant destined to lead to the discovery of a new world of more importance to humanity than that which columbus had just added to the old world following out his principle erasmus insisted that men should no longer study theology in scotus and thomas aquinas but go and learn it from the fathers of the church and above all from the new testament he showed that it was not even necessary to keep close to the vulgate which swarmed with faults and he rendered an immense service to truth by publishing his critical edition of the greek text of the new testament a text as little known in the west as if it had never existed this edition appeared at baal in fifteen hundred and sixteen the year before the reformation erasmus thus did for the new testament what reuchlin had done for the old theologians were thenceforth able to read the word of god in the original tongues and at a later period to recognize the purity of doctrine taught by the reformers i wish said erasmus on publishing his new testament to bring to its level that frigid wordy disputatious thing termed theology would to god the christian world may derive advantage from the work proportioned to the pain and toil which it has cost the wish was accomplished it was in vain for the monks to exclaim he is trying to correct the holy spirit the new testament of erasmus set forth a living light his paraphrases on the epistles and gospels of st matthew and st john his editions of cyprian and jerome his translations of origen athanasius and chrysostom his true theology his preacher his commentaries on several of the psalms contributed greatly to spread a taste for the word of god and pure theology the effect of his labours went even farther than his intentions reuchlin and erasmus restored the bible to the learned luther restored it to the people we have not yet described all that erasmus did when he restored the bible he called attention to its contents the highest aim of the revival of philosophical studies said he should be to give a knowledge of the pure and simple christianity of the bible an admirable sentiment 
would to god the organs of philosophy in our day were as well acquainted with their calling i am firmly resolved continued he to die studying the scriptures it is my joy and my peace the sum of all christian philosophy he elsewhere says is reduced to this to place all our hope in god who through grace without our merits gives us everything by jesus christ to know that we are ransomed by the death of his son to die to worldly lusts and walk conformably to his doctrine and his example not only doing no injury to any but on the contrary doing good to all to bear trials patiently in the hope of future recompense in fine to claim no credit to ourselves because of our virtues but give thanks to god for all our faculties and all our works these are the feelings which ought to pervade the whole man until they have become a second nature then raising his voice against the great mass of ecclesiastical injunctions regarding dress fasts feast days vows marriage and confessions by which the people were oppressed and the priest was enriched erasmus exclaims in churches the interpretation of the gospel is scarcely thought of the better part of sermons must meet the wishes of the commissaries of indulgences the holy doctrine of christ must be suppressed or interpreted contrary to its meaning and for their profit cure is now hopeless unless christ himself turn the hearts of kings and pontiffs and awaken them to inquire after true piety the works of erasmus rapidly succeeded each other he laboured incessantly and his writings were read just as they came from his pen that spirit that native life that rich refined sparkling and bold intellect which without restraint poured out its treasures before his contemporaries carried away and entranced vast numbers of readers who eagerly devoured the works of the philosopher of rotterdam in this way he soon became the most influential man in christendom and saw pensions and crowns raining down upon him from all quarters when we contemplate the great revolution which at a later period renewed the church it is impossible not to own that erasmus was used by many as a kind of bridge over which they passed many who would have taken alarm at evangelical truths if presented in all their force and purity yielded to the charm of his writings and ultimately figured among the most zealous promoters of the reformation but the very circumstance of his being good in preparing prevented him from being good at performing erasmus knows very well how to expose error says luther but he knows not how to teach the truth the gospel was not the fire which warmed and sustained his life the centre around which his activity radiated he was first of all a learned and in the second place only a christian man he was too much under the influence of vanity to have a decided influence on his age he anxiously calculated the effect which every step he took might have on his reputation and there was nothing he liked so much to talk of as himself and his fame the pope wrote he to an intimate friend with puerile vanity at the period when he became the declared opponent of luther the pope has sent me a letter full of kindness and expressions of respect his secretary solemnly vows that the like was never heard of and that it was written word for word at the pope's own dictation erasmus and luther are the representatives of two great ideas on the subject of reform and of two great parties of their own age and of all ages the one is composed of men whose leading characteristic is a prudential timidity the other of men of courage and resolution these two parties were at this period personified in these two distinguished heads the men of prudence thought that the cultivation of theological science might lead gradually and without disruption to the reformation of the church the men of action thought that the diffusion of more correct ideas among the learned would not put a stop to the superstitions of the people and that the correction of particular abuses was of little avail unless the whole life of the church were renewed 
a disadvantageous peace said erasmus is far better than the justest war he thought and how many erasmuses have been and still are in the world that a reformation which shook the church might run a risk of overturning it and he was therefore terrified when on looking forward he saw the passions of men excited saw evil everywhere mingling itself with any little good that could be accomplished existing institutions destroyed in the absence of others to supply their place and the vessel of the church leaking in every part and at length engulfed amid the storm those who bring the sea into new lagoons said he are often deceived in the result the formidable element once introduced does not take the direction which they wished to give it but rushes where it pleases and causes great devastation be this as it may continued he let disturbances be by all means avoided better put up with wicked princes than by innovations enthrone evil but the courageous among his contemporaries were prepared with their answer history had clearly enough demonstrated that a frank exposition of the truth and a mortal struggle with falsehood could alone secure the victory had temporizing and politic artifices been resorted to the wiles of the papal court would have extinguished the light in its first glimmerings had not all sorts of mild methods been tried for ages had not counsel been held after counsel with the view of reforming the church yet all had been useless why pretend to repeat an experiment that had so often failed no doubt a fundamental reform might be effected without disruption but when did anything great and good make its appearance among men without causing agitation this fear of seeing evil mingle with good if legitimate would arrest the noblest and holiest enterprises we must not fear the evil which may be heaved up in the course of great agitation but be strong in combating and destroying it besides is there not an entire difference between the commotion which human passions produces and that which emanates from the spirit of god the one shakes society the other consolidates it how erroneous to imagine like erasmus that in the state in which christianity then was with that mixture of opposite elements truth and falsehood life and death violent shocks might still be prevented as well might you try to shut the crater of vesuvius when the angry elements are actually at war in its bosom the middle ages had seen more than one violent commotion in an atmosphere less loaded with storms than at the period of the reformation the thing wanted at such a time is not to arrest and suppress but to direct and guide if the reformation had not burst forth who can tell the fearful ruin by which its place might have been supplied society a prey to a thousand elements of destruction and destitute of regenerating and conservative elements would have been dreadfully convulsed assuredly it would not have been a reform to the taste of erasmus or such an one as many moderate but timid men in our day dream of that would have then overtaken society the people devoid of that light and piety which the reformation carried down into the humblest ranks giving themselves up to the violence of their passions and to a restless spirit of revolt would have burst forth like a wild beast broken loose from its chain after having been goaded to madness the reformation was nothing but an interposition of the spirit of god among men a setting of the world in order by the hand of god no doubt it might stir up the fermenting elements which lie hidden in the human heart but god was there to overrule them evangelical doctrine heavenly truth penetrating the masses of the population destroyed what deserved to perish but at the same time gave new strength to all that deserved to remain the reformation exerted itself in building up and it is mere prejudice to allege that it destroyed the ploughshare too it has been truly said in speaking of the reformation might think it hurts the earth because it cuts it asunder whereas it only makes it productive the great principle of erasmus was give light and the darkness will disappear of itself 
the principle is good and luther acted on it but when the enemies of the light strive to extinguish it or to force the flambeau out of the hand which carries it is it necessary from a love of peace to let them do so ought not the wicked to be resisted erasmus was deficient in courage now courage is indispensable whether it be to effect a reformation or to storm a town there was much timidity in his character from a boy the very name of death made him tremble he was excessively anxious about his health and would grudge no sacrifice in order to escape from a place where some contagious malady prevailed his love of the comforts of life was greater even than his vanity and hence his rejection on more than one occasion of the most brilliant offers accordingly he made no pretensions to the character of a reformer if the corruptions of the court of rome demand some great and prompt remedy said he it is no affair of mine or of those like me he had not the strong faith which animated luther while the latter was always prepared to yield up his life for the truth erasmus candidly declared others may aspire to martyrdom as for me i deem not myself worthy of the honour were some tumult to arise i fear i would play the part of peter erasmus by his writings and his sayings had done more than any other man to prepare the reformation but when he saw the tempest which he himself had raised actually come he trembled he would have given anything to bring back the calm of other days even though accompanied with its dense fogs it was no longer time the embankment had burst and it was impossible to arrest the flood which was destined at once to purify and fertilize the world erasmus was powerful as an instrument of god but when he ceased to be so he was nothing ultimately erasmus knew not for which party to declare he was not pleased with any and he had his fears of all it is dangerous to speak said he and it is dangerous to be silent in all great religious movements we meet with those irresolute characters which though respectable in some points of view do injury to the truth and in wishing not to displease any displease all what would become of the truth did not god raise up bolder champions to defend it the following is the advice which erasmus gave to vigilius zuichem afterward president of the supreme court at brussels as to the manner in which he ought to conduct himself toward the sectaries this was the name by which he had already begun to designate the reformers my friendship for you makes me desirous that you should keep far aloof from the contagion of the sects and not furnish them with any pretext for saying zuichem is ours if you approve their doctrine at least disguise it and above all do not enter into discussion with them a lawyer should finesse with these people as a dying man once did with the devil the devil asked him what believest thou the dying man afraid that if he made a confession of his faith he might be surprised into some heresy replied what the church believes the devil rejoined what does the church believe the man again replied what i believe the devil once more and what dost thou believe what the church believes duke george of saxony a mortal enemy of luther receiving an equivocal answer from erasmus to a question which he had put to him said my dear erasmus wash the fur for me do not merely wet it secundus curio in one of his works describes two heavens the papistical and the christian heaven he does not find erasmus in either but discovers him moving constantly between them in endless circles such was erasmus he wanted that internal liberty which makes a man truly free how different he would have been if he had abandoned himself and sacrificed all for truth but after trying to effect some reforms with the approbation of the church and for rome deserting the reformation when he saw the two to be incompatible he lost himself with all parties on the one hand his palinodes could not suppress the rage of the fanatical partisans of the papacy 
they felt the mischief which he had done them and they did not forgive it impetuous monks poured out reproaches on him from the pulpit calling him a second lucium a fox that had laid waste the vineyard of the lord a doctor of constance had the portrait of erasmus hung up in his study that he might have it in his power at any moment to spit in his face on the other hand erasmus by deserting the standard of the gospel deprived himself of the affection and esteem of the noblest men of the period in which he lived and must doubtless have forfeited those heavenly consolations which god sheds in the hearts of those who conduct themselves as good soldiers of jesus christ at least we have some indication of this in his bitter tears his painful vigils and troubled sleep his disrelish for his food his disgust with the study of the muses once his only solace his wrinkled brow his pallid cheek his sad and sunken eye his hatred of a life to which he applies the epithet of cruel and those longings for death which he unbosoms to his friends poor erasmus the enemies of erasmus went we think somewhat beyond the truth when they exclaimed on luther's appearance erasmus laid the egg and luther has hatched it end of book one chapter eight book one chapter nine of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by christopher smith chapter nine the nobles huten letters of some obscure men sickingen kronberg hans sachs general fermentation the same symptoms of regeneration which we have seen among princes bishops and the learned existed among the men of the world among nobles knights and warriors the german nobility performed an important part in the reformation several of the most illustrious sons of germany entered into close alliance with the literati and inflamed with an ardent sometimes even an excessive zeal labored to deliver their countrymen from the yoke of rome various causes must have contributed to procure friends for the reformation among the ranks of the nobility some by their attendance at the universities had been warmed with the same flame that animated the learned others whose education had trained them to generous feelings had their minds predisposed in favour of the beautiful doctrines of the gospel to several the reformation seemed to present something of a chivalrous character which fascinated them and bore them along in its train lastly it must be acknowledged that not a few had a grudge at the clergy who had powerfully contributed in the reign of maximilian to deprive the nobles of their ancient independence and bring them under subjection to their sovereigns they in their enthusiasm considered the reformation as the prelude of a great political renovation they thought they saw the empire emerging from this crisis with a new splendour and hailed the better state brilliant with the purest glory which was on the eve of being established in the world by chivalrous swords not less than by the word of god ulrich de houten who on account of his philippics against the papacy has been surnamed the demosthenes of germany forms as it were the link which united the chevaliers and the men of letters he distinguished himself by his writings as much as by his sword descended from an ancient family in franconia he was sent at eleven years of age to the convent of fulda with the view of his becoming a monk but ulrich who had no inclination for this state ran off from the convent when he was sixteen and repaired to the university of cologne where he devoted himself to the study of languages afterwards leading an unsettled life he was in the ranks as a common soldier at the siege of padua in fifteen thirteen saw rome in all its disorder 
and there sharpen the arrows which he afterwards shot at her on his return to germany hutten wrote a pamphlet against rome entitled the roman trinity in which he unveils all the disorders of that court and shows the necessity of pulling down her tyranny by main force a traveller named vadiscus who figures prominently in the piece says there are three things which are usually brought back from rome a sore conscience a disordered stomach and an empty purse there are three things which rome does not believe the immortality of the soul the resurrection of the dead and hell there are three things in which rome carries on a trade the grace of christ ecclesiastical benefices and women the publication of this work obliged hutten to quit the court of the archbishop of mayence where he was residing when he composed it the affair of reuchlin with the dominicans was the signal which brought forward all the literati magistrates and nobles who were opposed to the monks the defeat of the inquisitors who it was said had only saved themselves from a regular and absolute sentence of condemnation by money and intrigue gave encouragement to all their adversaries councillors of the empire and magistrates of the most considerable towns Pirkheimer of Nuremberg, Peutinger of Augsburg, Stuss of Cologne, distinguished preachers such as Capito and Echolampadius, doctors of medicine, historians, all the literati, orators and poets, at the head of whom Ulrich de Hutten was conspicuous, formed the army of Reuchlinists, of whom a list was even published. The most remarkable production of this league was the famous popular satire entitled Letters of Some Obscure Men. This production was principally written by Hutton and one of his university friends, Crotus Robianus, but it is difficult to say with which of the two the idea originated, if indeed it was not with the learned printer Angst. It is even doubtful if Hutton had any hand in the first part of the work several humanists who had met in the fortress of ebenburg appear to have contributed to the second part it is a picture in bold characters a caricature sometimes coarsely painted but full of truth and vigour a striking likeness in colours of fire the effect was immense monks who are adversaries of reuchlin and the supposed authors of the letters discourse on the affairs of the time and on theological subjects after their own manner and in their barbarous latin they address to their correspondent or to ingratius professor at cologne and friend of pfefferkorn the silliest and most useless questions they give the most amusing proof of the excessive ignorance and incredulity their superstition their low and vulgar spirit their coarse gluttony in making a god of their belly and at the same time their pride their fanatical and persecuting zeal they inform him of several of their droll adventures their escapes their dissoluteness and a variety of scandals in the lives of hochstraten pfefferkorn and other leaders of their party the tone of these letters sometimes hypocritical and sometimes childish gives them a very comic effect and yet the whole is so natural that the dominicans and franciscans of england received the work with high approbation believing that it really was composed on the principles of their order and in defence of it a prior of brabant in his credulous simplicity purchased a great number of copies and presented them to the most distinguished among the dominicans the monks irritated more and more applied to the pope for a stringent bull against all who should dare to read these epistles but leo x refused to grant it they were accordingly obliged to put up with the general laugh and gulp down their rage no work gave a stronger blow to these pillars of papism but it was not by jesting and satire that the gospel was to triumph had this course been persisted in had the reformers instead of attacking the reformation with the weapons of god had recourse to the jeering spirit of the world the course had been lost luther loudly condemned these satires 
a friend having sent him one of them entitled the tenor of the supplication of pasquin he wrote in answer the foolish things you sent me appear to be written by a mind which is under no control i submitted them to a meeting of friends and they have all given the same opinion and speaking of the same work he writes to another of his correspondents this supplication appears to me to be by the same hand as the letters of some obscure men i approve of his wishes but i approve not of his work for he does not refrain from injury and insult this sentence is severe but it shows what kind of spirit was in luther and how superior he was to his contemporaries it must be added however that he was not at all times observant of these wise maxims ulrich having been obliged to renounce the protection of the archbishop of mayence applied for that of charles v who had at this time quarrelled with the pope and accordingly repaired to brussels where charles was holding his court but so far from obtaining anything he learned that the pope had required the emperor to send him to rome bound hand and foot the inquisitor hochstraten reuchlin's persecutor was one of those whom rome had charged to pursue him ulrich indignant that such a demand should have been made to the emperor quitted brabant when a short way from brussels he met hochstraten on the high road the inquisitor frightened out of his wits falls on his knees and commends his soul to god and the saints no said the knight i will not soil my sword with such blood as yours and giving him several strokes with the flat of his sword allowed him to depart hutten took refuge in the castle of ebenburg where francis de seckingen offered an asylum to all who were persecuted by the ultramontanists it was here that his ardent zeal for the emancipation of his country dictated the remarkable letters which he addressed to charles v frederick elector of saxony albert archbishop of mayence and the princes and nobles and which entitled him to a place among the most distinguished authors here too he composed all those works which being read and comprehended by the people inspired germany with a hatred of rome and a love of freedom devoted to the cause of the reformers his object was to induce the nobility to take up arms in favour of the gospel and fall with the sword on that rome which luther only wished to destroy by the word and by the invincible force of truth still amid all this fondness for war we are pleased at finding tenderness and delicacy of sentiment in hutten on the death of his parents though he was the eldest son he gave up all the family property to his brothers and prayed them not to write him or send him any money lest notwithstanding their innocence they might be brought into trouble by his enemies and fall into the ditch along with him if the truth cannot own hutten for one of her children for her companions are ever holiness of life and purity of heart she will at least make honourable mention of him as one of the most redoubtable adversaries of error a similar testimony may be borne to francois de seckingen his illustrious friend and patron this noble chevalier whom several of his contemporaries deemed worthy of the imperial crown holds first place among the warriors who were the antagonists of rome while delighting in the noise of arms he had an ardent love of science and a high veneration for its professors when at the head of an army which threatened Württemberg, he gave orders in the event of stuttgart being taken by assault to spare the property and house of the celebrated scholar john reuchlin he afterwards invited him to his camp and embracing him offered to assist him in his quarrel with the monks of cologne for a long time chivalry had gloried in despising literature but this period presents us with a different spectacle under the massy cuirass of the seckingens and hutens we perceive the intellectual movement which is beginning to be everywhere felt the first fruits which the reformation gives to the world are warriors enamoured with the arts of peace 
Hutton, who, on his return from Brussels, had taken refuge in the castle of Sekingen, invited the valorous knight to study the evangelical doctrine, and make him acquainted with the foundations on which it rests. "'And is there any one, exclaimed Sekingen in astonishment, who dares to overturn such an edifice? Who could do it?' Several individuals, who afterwards became celebrated as reformers, found an asylum in this castle. Among others, Martin Busa, Aquila, Schwebel, and Ecolampadius, so that Hütten justly styled Erbenburg the Hotel of the Just. Ecolampadius had to preach daily in the castle, but the warriors there assembled began to weary hearing so much of the meek virtues of Christianity, and the sermons of Ecolampadius, though he laboured to shorten them, seemed too long. They indeed repaired to the church almost every day, but for the most part only to hear the blessing and offer a short prayer. Hence Ecolampadius exclaimed, Alas, the word is here sown on stony ground. Sekingen, longing to serve the cause of the truth in his own way, declared war on the Archbishop of Treves, in order, as he said, to open a door for the gospel. In vain did Luther, who had by this time appeared, endeavour to dissuade him. He attacked Treves with five thousand knights and a thousand common soldiers, but the bold Archbishop, aided by the Elector Palatine and the Landgrave of Hesse, forced him to retreat. The following spring the allied princes attacked him in his castle of Landstein. After a bloody assault, Sekingen, having been mortally wounded, was forced to surrender. The three princes, accordingly, make their way into the fortress, and, after searching through it, at last find the indomitable knight on his deathbed in a subterraneous vault. He stretches out his hand to the Elector Palatine, without seeming to pay any attention to the other princes, who overwhelm him with questions and reproaches. "'Leave me at rest,' said he to them. "'I am now preparing to answer a mightier than you.' When Luther heard of his death, he exclaimed, "'The Lord is just, yet wonderful. It is not with the sword that he means to propagate the gospel.' Such was the sad end of a warrior, who, as emperor or elector, might perhaps have raised Germany to high renown, but who, confined within a limited circle, wasted the great powers with which he was endowed. It was not in the tumultuous spirit of these warriors that divine truth, which had come down from heaven, was to take up her abode. Theirs were not the weapons by which she was to conquer. God, in annihilating the mad projects of Sekingen, gave a new illustration of the saying of St. Paul, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Another chevalier, Harmut of Kronberg, a friend of Hutten and Sekingen, appears to have had more wisdom and more knowledge of the truth. He wrote with great moderation to Leo X, beseeching him to give up his temporal power to its rightful possessor, viz. the emperor. Addressing his dependents like a father, he endeavoured to make them comprehend the doctrines of the gospel, and exhorted them to faith, obedience, and confidence in Jesus Christ, who, added he, is the sovereign Lord of all. He resigned a pension of two hundred ducats into the hands of the emperor, because he was unwilling, as he expressed it, to continue in the service of one who lent his ear to the enemies of truth. I have somewhere met with a beautiful saying of his which seems to place him far above Hutton and Sekingen. The Holy Spirit, our heavenly teacher, is able, when he pleases, to teach us more of the faith of Christ in one hour than we could learn in ten years at the University of Paris. Those who look for the friends of Reformation only on the steps of thrones, or in cathedrals and academies, and maintain that no such friends exist among the people, are under a serious mistake. 
God, while preparing the heart of the wise and powerful, was also preparing, in retirement, many simple and humble-minded men, who were one day to become obedient to the word. The history of the period gives evidence of the fermentation which was then going on among the humbler classes. The popular literature, previous to the Reformation, had a tendency directly opposed to the spirit which was prevalent in the church. In the Eulenspiegel, a celebrated popular poetical collection of the period, the laugh is incessantly kept up at priests, beasts, and gluttons, who keep full-stocked cellars, fine horses, and well-lined pantries. In the Renard Reinecke, the household of priests, with their little children, play an important part. Another popular writer thunders with all his might against those ministers of Christ who ride splendid horses but won't fight the infidels. And John Rosenblut, in one of his carnival games, brings the Grand Turk upon the stage to preach a seasonable sermon to all the states of Christendom. It was unquestionably in the bowels of the people that the Reformation, which was soon to break out, was fermenting. Not only from this class were youths seen coming forth, who were afterwards to occupy the first stations in the church, but even individuals who continued all their lives to labour in the humblest professions contributed powerfully to the great awakening of Christendom. It may be proper to give some traits in the life of one of them. On the 5th of November, 1494, a tailor of Nuremberg, by name Hans Sachs, had a son born to him. The son, named Hans, John, like his father, after having received some schooling, was apprenticed to a shoemaker. Young Hans availed himself of the liberty of thought which this humble profession afforded to penetrate into the higher world in which his soul delighted songs after they ceased in the castles of chivalry seem to have sought and to have found an asylum among the burghers of the joyous cities of germany a singing school was held in the church of nuremberg the performances which took place there and in which young hans was accustomed to join opened his heart to religious impressions and helped to awaken a taste for poetry and music the genius of the youth could not long brook confinement within the walls of his workshop. He wished to see with his own eyes that world of which he had read so much and been told so many stories by his comrades, and which his imagination peopled with wonders. In 1511 he bundles up his effects and sets out in the direction of the south. The young traveller, falling in with gay comrades, students roaming the country, and many dangerous temptations, soon feels a serious struggle within. The lusts of the world and his pious resolutions war with each other. Trembling for the result, he takes flight, and, in 1513, hides himself in the little town of Wels in Austria, where he lives in retirement, devoting himself to the study of the fine arts. The Emperor Maximilian happens to pass through the town with a brilliant suit, and the young poet is quite fascinated with the splendour of the court. The prince receives him into his hunting train, and Hans once more forgets himself under the noisy vaults of the palace of Innsbruck. But his conscience again sounds the alarm, and the young huntsman, immediately throwing aside his brilliant uniform, takes his departure and arrives at Schwatz near Munich. There, in 1514, at the age of twenty, he composes his first hymn, In Honour of God, setting it to a remarkable air. It was received with great applause. In the course of his journeys he was witness to many sad proofs of the abuses under which religion groaned. On his return to Nuremberg, Hans commences business, marries, and becomes the father of a family. When the Reformation breaks out, he turns a listening ear. He cordially welcomes the Holy Scripture, which had already endeared itself to him as a poet, and he no longer searches it for images and hymns, but for the light of truth. To this truth he consecrates his lyre. 
from a humble stall in front of one of the gates of the imperial city of nuremberg come forth notes which re-echo over germany and everywhere excite a deep interest in the great revolution which is going forward the spiritual songs of hans sachs and his bible turned into verse greatly aided the work indeed it would be difficult to say which of the two did most for it the elector of saxony vicegerent of the empire or the shoemaker of nuremberg thus then there was something in all classes which announced a reformation on all sides signs appeared and events pressed forward threatening to overthrow the work of ages of darkness and introduce men to a period in which all things were to become new the hierarchical form which several ages had been employed in stamping upon the world was on the eve of being effaced the light which had just been discovered had with inconceivable rapidity introduced a number of new ideas into all countries and all classes of society gave signs of new life o oh, age exclaims hutton studies flourish and minds awake mere life is joy the human intellect which had been slumbering for so many generations seemed desirous by its activity to redeem the time which it had lost to have left it in idleness without nourishment or to have given it no better food than that which had long maintained its languid existence would have been to mistake the nature of man the human mind having at length perceived what it was and what it ought to be looked boldly at these two states and scanned the immense abyss which lay between them great princes were on the throne the ancient colossus of rome was tottering under its own weight and the old spirit of chivalry was taking leave of the earth to make way for a new spirit which breathed at once on the sanctuaries of knowledge and on the dwellings of the poor the printed word had taken wing and been carried as the wind does certain seeds to the most distant regions the discovery of the two indies had enlarged the world everything announced that a great revolution was at hand but whence will the blow come which is to strike down the ancient edifice that a new edifice may arise out of its ruins nobody could say who had more wisdom than frederick more science than reuchlin more talent than erasmus more spirit and versatility than hutton more valour than Seckingen, more virtue than kronberg and yet neither frederick nor reuchlin nor erasmus nor Seckingen, nor hutton nor kronberg learned men princes warriors the church herself had sapped some of the foundations but there they had stopped the powerful hand which god had designed to employ was nowhere to be seen all however felt that it must soon make its appearance while some even pretended to have seen indications of it in the stars one class seeing the miserable state of religion predicted the near approach of antichrist another class on the contrary predicted a speedy reformation the world was waiting luther appeared End of chapter 9, end of book 1「Book 2 of History of the Reformation in the 16th Century, Volume 1, by Jean-Henri Mel d'Aubigné, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christopher Smith. Book 2 youth conversion and first labours of luther fourteen eighty three to fifteen seventeen chapter one luther his parentage the paternal roof strict discipline school the shunamite his studies university all was ready god takes ages to prepare his work but when the hour is come accomplishes it by the feeblest instruments to do great things by small means is the law of god this law which appears in every department of nature is found also in history god took the reformers of the church where he had taken the apostles 
he selected them from that humble class which without containing the meanest of the people is scarcely the length of citizenship everything must manifest to the world that the work is not of man but of god the reformer zuinglius comes forth from the hut of a shepherd in the alps melanchthon the theologian of the reformation from the workshop of an armourer and luther from the cottage of a poor miner the first stage in a man's life that in which he is formed and moulded under the hand of god is always important and was so especially in the case of luther there even at that period the whole reformation existed the different phases of that great work succeeded each other in the soul of him who was the instrument of accomplishing it before it was actually accomplished the knowledge of the reformation which took place in luther's heart is the only key to the reformation of the church we must study the particular work if we would attain to a knowledge of the general work those who neglect the one will never know more than the form and exterior of the other they may acquire a knowledge of certain events and certain results but the intrinsic nature of the revival they cannot know because the living principle which formed the soul of it is hidden from them let us then study the reformation in luther before studying it in the events which changed the face of christendom in the village of mora towards the forests of thuringia and not far from the spot where boniface the apostle of germany began to proclaim the gospel there existed and undoubtedly had existed for ages an ancient and numerous family of the name of luther the eldest son as usual with the peasantry of thuringia always succeeded to the house and the paternal plot while the younger members of the family set out in quest of a livelihood john luther having married margaret lindemann daughter of an inhabitant of neustadt in the bishopric of Warzburg, the married couple removed from the plains of isenach and fixed their residence in the little town of eisleben in saxony in order to gain their bread by the sweat of their brow seckendorf relates on the testimony of robhan superintendent of isenach in sixteen hundred and one that luther's mother thinking she was still far from her time had gone to the fair of eisleben and there unexpectedly gave birth to a son notwithstanding of the credit due to such a man as seckendorf this account appears not to be correct in fact none of the older biographers of luther make any mention of it besides mora is more than twenty-four leagues distant from eisleben and persons in the circumstances in which luther's mother then was seldom are disposed to take such long journeys to go to the fair in fine the account seems quite at variance with luther's own statement john luther was an upright straightforward hard-working man with a firmness of character bordering on obstinacy of a more cultivated mind than usual with persons of his class he was a great reader books were then rare but he never let pass any opportunity of procuring them they were his relaxation in the intervals of repose from hard and long continued labour margaret possessed the virtues which adorn honest and pious women she was remarked in particular for her modesty her fear of god and her spirit of prayer the mothers of the place regarded her as a model whom they ought to imitate it is not exactly known how long this couple had been fixed at eisleben when on the tenth of november an hour before midnight margaret gave birth to a son melanchthon often questioned the mother of his friend as to the period of his birth i remember the day and the hour very well would she reply but for the year i am not certain of it luther's brother james an honest and upright man has stated that in the opinion of all the family martin was born in the year of christ fourteen hundred and eighty three on the tenth of november being st martin's eve the first thought of the pious parents was to take the infant which god had given them and dedicate it to god in holy baptism on the following day which happened to be a tuesday 
the father with gratitude and joy carried his son to st peter's church where he received the seal of his dedication to the lord he was named martin in honor of the day young martin was not six months old when his parents quitted eisleben for mansfeld which is only five leagues distant the mines of mansfeld were then much famed and john luther a laboring man feeling that he might perhaps be called to rear a numerous family hoped he might there more easily gain a livelihood it was in this town that the intellect and powers of young luther received their first development here his activity began to be displayed and his disposition to be manifested by what he said and did the plains of mansfeld the banks of the vipper were the scenes of his first sports with his playmates the commencement of their residence at mansfeld was attended with painful privations to honest john and his wife for they lived some time in great poverty my parents says the reformer were very poor my father was a poor woodcutter and my mother often carried his wood on her back to procure subsistence for us children the toil they endured for us was severe even to blood the example of parents whom he respected and the habits in which they trained him early accustomed luther to exertion and frugality often doubtless he accompanied his mother to the wood and made up his little faggot also promises are given to the just man's labor and john luther experienced the reality of them having become somewhat more easy in his circumstances he established two smelting furnaces at mansfeld around these furnaces young martin grew up and the return which they yielded enabled his father at a later period to provide for his studies the spiritual founder of christendom says worthy mathesius was to come forth from a family of miners an image of what god purposed when he employed him to cleanse the sons of levi and purify them in his furnaces like gold universally respected for his integrity his blameless life and good sense john luther was made a counsellor of mansfeld the capital of the county of that name too great wretchedness might have weighed down the spirit of the child but the easy circumstances of the paternal roof expanded his heart and elevated his character john availed himself of his new situation to cultivate the society which he preferred he set great value on educated men and often invited the clergymen and teachers of the place to his table his house presented an example of one of those societies of simple citizens which did honour to germany at the commencement of the sixteenth century and as a mirror reflected the numerous images which succeeded each other on the troubled stage of that time it was not lost on the child the sight of men to whom so much respect was shown in his father's house must doubtless on more than one occasion have awakened in young martin's heart an ambitious desire one day to become a schoolmaster or a man of learning as soon as he was of an age to receive some instruction his parents sought to give him the knowledge and inspire him with the fear of god and to train him in christian virtues their utmost care was devoted to his primary domestic education this however was not the sole object of their tender solicitude his father desirous of seeing him acquire the elements of knowledge for which he himself had so much esteem invoked the divine blessing on his head and sent him to school as martin was still a very little boy his father or nicholas emler a young man of mansfeld often carried him in their arms to the house of george emilius and went again to fetch him emler afterwards married one of luther's sisters the piety of the parents their activity and strict virtue gave a happy impulse to the boy making him of a grave and attentive spirit the system of education which then prevailed employed fear and punishment as its leading stimulants margaret though sometimes approving the too strict discipline of her husband often opened her maternal arms to martin to console him in his tears 
she herself occasionally carried to excess that precept of divine wisdom which says he that spareth the rod hateth his son the impetuous temper of the child often led to frequent reproof and correction my parents says luther in after life treated me harshly and made me very timid my mother one day chastised me about a filbert till the blood came they believed with all their hearts that they were doing right but they could not discriminate between dispositions though this is necessary in order to know when and how punishments should be inflicted the poor child's treatment at school was not less severe his master one morning beat him fifteen times in succession it is necessary said luther when mentioning the fact it is necessary to chastise children but it is necessary at the same time to love them with such an education luther early learned to despise the allurements of a sensual life he who is to become great must begin with little justly remarks one of his earliest biographers and if children are brought up with too much delicacy and tenderness it does them harm all the rest of their life martin learned something at school he was taught the heads of the catechism the ten commandments the apostles creed the lord's prayer hymns forms of prayer and the donat this last was a latin grammar composed in the fourth century by donatus st jerome's master and having been improved in the eleventh century by a french monk named remigius was long in high repute as a schoolbook he moreover committed to memory the sisio janus a very singular almanac composed in the tenth or eleventh century in short he learned all that was taught in the latin school of mansfeld but the child seems not to have been brought to god the only religious sentiment which could be discovered in him was that of fear whenever he heard jesus christ mentioned he grew pale with terror for the saviour had been represented to him as an angry judge this servile fear so foreign to genuine religion perhaps predisposed him for the glad tidings of the gospel and for the joy which he afterwards experienced when he became acquainted with him who is meek and lowly in heart john luther longed to make his son a learned man the new light which began to radiate in all directions penetrated even the cottage of the miner of mansfeld and there awakened ambitious thoughts the remarkable disposition and persevering application of his son inspired john with the most brilliant hopes accordingly in fourteen hundred and ninety seven when martin had completed his fourteenth year his father resolved to part with him and sent him to a school of the franciscans at magdeburg margaret behoved of course to consent and martin prepared to quit the paternal roof magdeburg was like a new world to martin amid numerous privations for he had scarcely the means of subsistence he read and attended lectures andre proles provincial of the augustine order was then preaching with great fervour on the necessity of reforming religion and the church he however was not the person who deposited in the young man's soul the first germ of those ideas which afterwards expanded in it this period was a kind of severe apprenticeship to luther launched upon the world at fourteen without friend or patron he trembled in the presence of his masters and during the hours of recreation painfully begged his food with children as poor as himself i and my comrades said he begged a little food for our subsistence one day at the season when the church celebrates the birth of jesus christ we were in a body scouring the neighbouring villages going from house to house and in four parts singing the ordinary hymns on the babe at bethlehem we stopped before a peasant's cottage which stood by itself at the extremity of a village the peasant hearing us singing our christmas carols came out with some provisions which he meant to give to us and asked in a gruff voice and a harsh tone where are you boys his tones frightened us and we took to our heels 
we had no cause for fear for the peasant was sincere in his offer of assistance but our hearts were no doubt made timid by the menaces and tyranny with which masters at this period oppressed their scholars hence the sudden fright which seized us at last however the peasant still continuing to call us we stopped laid aside our fear and running up to him received the food which he intended for us in the same way adds luther are we wont to tremble and flee when our conscience is guilty and alarmed then we are afraid even of the assistance which is offered to us and of those who are friendly to us and would do us all sorts of kindness a year had scarcely passed when john and margaret on being made aware of the difficulties which their son had in living in magdeburg sent him to isenach where there was a celebrated school and they had a number of relations they had other children and though their circumstances had improved they were unable to maintain their son in a strange town the forges and late hours of john luther did no more than keep the family at mansfeld it was hoped that martin would find a livelihood more easily at isenach but he was not more successful his relations in the town did not trouble themselves about him perhaps their own poverty made them unable to give him any assistance when the scholar felt the gnawings of hunger he had no resource but to do as at magdeburg to join his fellow students and sing with them before the houses for a morsel of bread this custom of the time of luther has been preserved even to our day in several towns of germany where the voices of the boys sometimes produce a most harmonious chant instead of bread poor modest martin often received only hard words then overcome with sadness he shed many tears in secret unable to think of the future without trembling one day in particular he had been repulsed from three houses and was preparing without having broken his fast to return to his lodging when on arriving at st george's square he halted and absorbed in gloomy thoughts stood motionless before the house of an honest burgher will it be necessary from want of bread to give up study and go and work with his father in the mines of mansfeld suddenly a door opens and a female is seen on the threshold it was the wife of conrad cotter the daughter of the burgomaster of illefeld her name was ursula the chronicles of isenach call her the pious shunamite in allusion to her who so earnestly pressed the prophet elisha to eat bread with her previous to this the christian shunamite had more than once observed young martin in the assemblies of the faithful and been touched by the sweetness of his voice and his devout behaviour she had just heard the harsh language addressed to the poor scholar and seeing him in sadness before her door she came to his assistance beckoned him to enter and set food before him to appease his hunger conrad approved of the benevolence of his wife and was even so much pleased with the society of young luther that some days after he took him home to his house from this moment his studies were secure he will not be obliged to return to the mines of mansfeld and bury the talent with which god has entrusted him when he no longer knew what was to become of him god opened to him the heart and home of a christian family this event helped to give him that confidence in god which in after life the strongest tempests could not shake in the house of cotta luther was introduced to a mode of life very different from that which he had hitherto known he there led an easy existence exempt from want and care his mind became more serene his disposition more lively and his heart more open his whole being expanded to the mild rays of charity and began to beat with life and joy and happiness his prayers were more ardent and his thirst for knowledge more intense he made rapid progress to literature and science he added the charms of art those who are designed by god to act upon their contemporaries are themselves in the first instance seized and carried along by all the tendencies of their age luther learned to play on the flute and the lute 
the latter instrument he often accompanied with his fine counter voice thus enlivening his heart in moments of sadness he took pleasure also in employing his notes to testify his gratitude to his adopted mother who was very fond of music his own love of it continued to old age and both the words and the music of some of the finest anthems which germany possesses are his composition some have even been translated into our language happy time for the young man luther always remembered it with emotion many years after a son of conrad having come to study at wittemberg when the poor scholar of isenach had become the doctor of his age he gladly received him at his table and under his roof he wished to pay back to the son part of what he had received from the parents it was while thinking of the christian woman who gave him food when all besides repulsed him that he gave utterance to this fine expression earth has nothing gentler than the female heart in which piety dwells luther was never ashamed of the days when pressed by hunger he was under the necessity of begging for his studies and his maintenance so far from this he on the contrary reflected with gratitude on the great poverty of his youth he regarded it as one of the means which god had employed to make him what he afterwards became and he felt thankful for it the poor youths who were obliged to follow the same course touched his heart do not said he despise the boys who sing before your houses and ask panem propter deum bread for the love of god i have done it myself it is true that at a later period my father with great love and kindness kept me at the university of erfurt maintaining me by the sweat of his brow still i once was a poor beggar and now by means of my pen i am come thus far that i would not change situations with the grand turk himself nay more were all the goods of the world piled up one above another i would not take them in exchange for what i have and yet i should not be where i am if i had not been at school and learned to write thus in these first humble beginnings this great man traced the origin of his fame he fears not to remind us that that voice whose accents made the empire and the world to tremble had once begged a morsel of bread in the streets of a poor city the christian takes pleasure in such recollections as reminding him that it is in god he must glory the strength of his intellect and the liveliness of his imagination soon enabled him to outstrip all his fellow students his progress was particularly rapid in ancient languages eloquence and poetry he wrote essays and made verses lively complaisant and what is called good-hearted he was a great favourite with his masters and his comrades among the professors he attached himself particularly to john trebonius a learned man of pleasing manners who showed youth those attentions which are so well fitted to encourage them martin had remarked that when trebonius entered the class he took off his hat and bowed to the students great condescension in those pedantic times this had pleased the young man and made him feel that he was not a mere cipher the respect of the master had made the pupil rise in his own estimation the colleagues of trebonius who had not the same custom of taking off their hats having one day expressed their astonishment at his extreme condescension he replied and the reply made no less impression on young luther among these youths are men whom god will one day make burgomasters chancellors doctors and magistrates and though you do not yet see them with their badges of office it is right however to show them respect 